do bow before you. And we just thank you for your presence and for the fact that you, Lord Jesus, have been exalted in this house. We exalt the man, Christ Jesus, and we're grateful to you for all that you have done for us, Lord. We do just bow our hearts before you. And, Lord, we just ask today that you just come and you speak. Oh, God, we thank you for the word that you have given to Ken. And, oh, Lord, I pray that you would speak through him whatever you want, Lord. He's made his plans, but we pray that you would just by your spirit would speak not by power nor by might but by the spirit of the living god just come and bypass anything that he wants to set them what they plan to say that's not what you want and lord we do just ask for that two-edged sword to come and divide the soul and the spirit that we will have ears to hear in our spirit that we will hear the word of the Lord and Father we thank you that it will accomplish what you sent it to do but let it be life let revelation light come inwardly to us as we hear the word that would bring transformation God we just ask for that that word to run in, in swiftly not just here. We want it to be planted within our heart. We want to receive that implanted word, but we want it to run swiftly, and we want it to be glorified in the earth. And we say, come, come, kingdom of God, have your way today, we pray in Jesus' name. And Father, I also want to add to that that you come and you sanctify us with the truth of the word, we pray in Jesus' name. Yes, yes. Uh, amen, amen. Well, this is, uh, we're continuing our uh, teaching series where we're dealing with our Forerunner School class called um, A Theology of the Bride. So we're continuing that. Uh, and I'm in the midst of kind of like a subsection or subset of that, of that class where we're going through all of the key uh, passages in the New Testament that deal with the bride. So we spent uh, three sessions dealing with about six different passages in the book of Revelation, and we finished that in the last session. Uh, and now in this session, we'll move uh, to the Gospels, and we'll move to the, uh, specifically to the Gospel of Matthew, where we'll deal with two different passages. I'll deal with this one of them in this session, session six, and then in session seven, we will deal with... Uh, the, the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. So we're going to deal with the, what we're doing is we're, we're going through these different passages with, with really two objectives. The first one is just to find out, okay, what does the, script, what do the scriptures teach uh, about the bride and the bride making herself ready uh, to go, to take a kind of a deep dive. So I've been trying to, to really go deep in these things, maybe a little bit more deeper than what we do in a typical message because I want us to understand uh, the theology of it and the scriptural support for it and, and, and things like that. So we, we deal with, the, with what, the, what the text is saying about the bride and the bride making herself ready. Uh, and then the, other, the second objective is to try to answer that question, is every born-again believer, will every born-again believer be the eternal wife of the Lamb or will it be a, a people who have made themselves ready uh, to be that. And I think what we're laying the foundation for is our belief that not every born again believer will be the eternal wife of the Lamb, but those who make themselves ready. Now we dealt with that with the te various teachings in the book of Revelation. And now we're going to go and we'll deal with that in uh, Matthew chapter 22. So anyway, we're, we're, we're doing that. Let me do a little bit of, uh, 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 well actually let me, let me do this. Let me read the uh, parable from the Ma from uh, Matthew chapter 22. Uh, let's see if I can find it here. I think I've got everything here. Let me just read it from the Bible. I got it. My my scripture verses got messed up somehow. There's been a lot of really. Uh, you know what? I was when we prayed for the the resistance or the opposition or. The, uh, that that I, I, that's one reason I really wanted prayer was because uh, I was feeling uh, a lot of that related to this message. I think this message is an important one, but there's a lot of opposition that has been coming with it. So anyway, let me read let me read the the parable. Um, 
Uh, Matthew chapter 22, starting with verse 1, we'll read the first, it's going to be 14 verses, but I think it's important to set the stage uh, for this. And, and Jesus answered and spoke to them in parables, saying, uh, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves. Uh, he sent out other slaves. Um, this print in my font, just, but that's one reason I printed the stuff out so I can read it better. Say, so, tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered, butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went on their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And then the rest seized his slave and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged and sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their cities on fire. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. And those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw there a man not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And he was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness in that place where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So it's a pretty uh, serious uh, teaching by Jesus there uh, that he's inviting people to the wedding feast uh, and many rejected that. Many said no to that invitation. Many just didn't pay any attention to it. Many even opposed Christ, uh, the, the servants of Christ, even themselves. But, but the, the king sent out uh, slave servants out into the highways and the byways uh, and the wedding hall was filled. Uh, but then when the king comes in to explain and, and examine the, those who had come into the wedding hall, uh, there was one who didn't have wedding garments on. And that person was cast, was bound, hand and foot, and cast out into the outer darkness. So we want to, uh, obviously it's a, it's a serious text, and we want to see what uh, is happening here in this text. So anyway, let's set the context uh, for it. If you remember from the last session, we dealt with um, we dealt with Revelation chapter 19, uh, starting with verse uh, 11. We dealt with 19, starting with verse 11, where uh, the, the 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 bride had made herself ready. The bride had made herself ready, uh, starting with verse 7. Remember this: Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. And it was given to her to clothe her in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then verse 9, And he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that's the context of Matthew 22. And he said to me, These are true words of God. So the bride has made her, in Revelation 19, the passage we just read, the bride has made herself ready. Then immediately after that, what happens is starting with verse 11 is that the, the heavens open up and Christ returns with his armies of angels and, uh, and the saints. And we looked at that in the last uh, session. He was riding on a white horse uh, and also those that were with him were riding on white horses. Uh, and so we talked last week about the white horse as symbolic of a conquering king who comes. And so Jesus is going to come as a conquering king. He's going to come as that, as that conquering king. When he returns, he will come and he will destroy all of his enemies. And he will gather his bride from the four corners uh, of the air of the, of, and, and, the, and they will enter into the, the grace of Jerusalem in the marriage, in the marriage supper of the Lamb 
uh, will take place. So he will come. When he comes again, he will come as a conquering king riding on a white horse. But now, amen, amen. Now let's go back now. To, I'm still setting the context here. Matthew chapter 21 Jesus, Matthew 21, of course, uh, verse 22 is set right after the next chapter after 21, obviously. But here's what happens in, sa in cha Matthew chapter 21. Jesus enters. This is on Palm Sunday. What we celebrate is Palm Sunday. Jesus enters Jerusalem. He enters Jerusalem to Hosanna in the highest on Palm Sunday with all the people giving him honor and praise. But this time he doesn't ride on a white horse, he rides on a donkey. He rides on a donkey. And you can see it in Matthew chapter 21. And so there's a, quite a distinction and a parallel. That it's not by accident that he comes back on a white horse, the triumphant king. But he comes in this, in Matthew 21, the triumphant uh, entry on a donkey. That animal of, of, of bearing a burden, the animal of humility. And he comes with an invitation. You can, you can see that, you know, he spends a week before he goes to the cross. After he enters in 21, you can see that he does that. He comes to the temple and he cleanses it. Uh, but he also heals the, the blind and the lame. lame, the lame. He, he heals them. Uh, and then you can see he teaches and he teaches uh, Matthew 22 about the parable of the marriage supper. He teaches Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. He teaches uh, on a number of other things. He speaks a lot about the second coming. Uh, but the overriding thing, this is what I want you to see. The overriding theme of his teaching in, in, in this last week of his ministry, when he comes in riding on this donkey, it, there is an invitation there is an invitation to get ready. There's an invitation to be made ready. Because when he comes back the second time, those that will be with him have made themselves ready. And so now he comes on a donkey, picturing humility, picturing the suffering servant coming with an invitation to each who were there to make themselves ready. And you see it, you see it in Matthew uh, chapter 24. You see it there. There's a lot of teaching about the end times. And if you start with verse uh, 42 or so, uh, he says this, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. Now, speaking to his disciples, he says, for this reason, you be ready to be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. So here, here's the context of this, of this parable that we're going to be looking at. He's saying, when I come back, there won't be a chance for salvation. And, you know, Hebrews makes that really clear. Uh, he'll be coming as a king, a conquering king and a bridegroom coming for those who have made themselves ready. But in his mercy, in his grace, he's given an invitation when he enters going to the cross and he says, this is what's going to happen, but I'm giving you an invitation to make yourself ready, to make yourself ready for my coming. And it's a lot more than just being born again. That's part of it. Obviously, that's the first step of it. But there's, a, there's an invitation to, as we'll see in this parable, to put on bridal garments, to make ourselves ready. Now, he's giving that same invitation. This is what I want you to see now. He's giving that same invitation to us in the church age. We have the time from his coming to the cross until he returns to make ourselves ready. The church does. We personally have the time from the time we're born again till we die or the Lord comes back, whichever is first, to make ourselves ready. So there's an invitation uh, to make ourselves ready. So 
in that context, in that context, Jesus puts this principle of Matthew uh, chapter uh, Matthew chapter 22, the parable of the of the ten virgins, and so. I'm sorry, I got all these notes all mixed up for somehow. But anyway, uh, um, okay. So let's look at let's look at this parable of the of the marriage feast. Uh, let's kind of walk through it verse uh, by verse, starting with Matthew 22. So I want you to see it, and we're going to spend a good bit of time when we get to the outer darkness and the weeping and the gnashing uh, of teeth. So let's uh, let's kind of walk through it and make some principles of understanding. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again in parables, saying, uh, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave, who gave a wedding feast for his son. Now, here, here's, here's a principle here. And, and there's a lot of people who don't agree with this in the body of Christ, but it's important. There really will be a wedding. And there really will be a wedding feast. It will be real. It's not just a picture of that we'll enjoy Jesus. It's not just a picture of, the, of a, a certain character traits about the bride and our relationship with Christ. There really will be a wedding, and there really will be a wedding feast. Matt, Revelation 19, 7 and 8 and 9 that we just read said, Blessed, Jesus said this, or they had the angels say this, Blessed is he who is invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, he would not have said that uh, if there were not going to be a real marriage feast and a real wedding. It's something that, as a believer, we need to be looking forward to. We need to, we need to be excited about it. I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I like to eat. Do you like to eat? <laughs> and you know, when you look at it, it said, okay, I'm preparing aged beef. Prime, prime rib, <laughs> yeah, oxtails and rice, Larry. <laughs> but anyway, I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to imagine that we'll really eat in heaven, I, you know. But there will be, there will be a marriage supper. There will be a wedding uh, between Christ and his bride. Um, and it goes on. Verse 3, and he sent out his slaves to call those who had invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. And he sent out other slaves, saying to those who had been invited, Behold, I prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fattened livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them. And so the king was enraged and sent out his armies and destroyed them, those murderers, and set their city on fire. Now, let's, let, me, let me talk a little bit about uh, some of this in this section. He sent out his slaves. You know, if you look at the New American Standard translation, you get the word slaves. If you look at a lot of the other translations, you get the word servant. But the word here, the Greek word here uh, is doulos, doulos, D O U. L O S. The Greek word here is translated that. And what it means is it's a Greek word that, that has the meaning of someone who has been uh, bought from the slave market and is now free, but chooses to be a servant, a love slave or a bond, or bond servant uh, of, of whoever, but in this case of the Lord. And so the points that he's sending out, sending out to invite people are doulos. They're, they're, uh, you know, it, it says in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, that Paul was a bond servant of Jesus. Uh, that's that word doulos, a one word doulos. And so that's, you know, we're looking at, at forerunners. And so <clears throat> as we look at forerunners, we are the ones God is sending out. He's sending out forerunners. I mean, of course, he's sending out his pastors and leaders and the entire body of Christ. But as we apply it to forerunners, he's sending out forerunners. And so there's, there's a trait that he's looking for in us. 
He wants us to be bond servants of Jesus, bond servants of Jesus. He wants us to be those, those people who are free. We're, we don't have to do this. Nobody, he's not making us do it. He's bought us, he's bought us off the slave market, and he's taken us into the kingdom of God, and he's freed us. We don't have to do it, but he wants us to choose to lay down our life totally and completely to him as though we were a slave to him, to do his bidding and his bidding alone. Uh, now, that's a challenge, isn't it? I mean, we really begin to think about it. It's a challenge because we all have our things that we want to do, we want the ways we want to spend our life, things that we want to accomplish. We all have those things. But God is saying to, the, to his slaves, to his servants, who will go out and invite people to the marriage supper of the Lamb, which would be us as forerunners, he said, I want you to lay down all this other stuff. You lay it down, and you become a slave to me. Regardless of whether people like what you say, regardless of whatever, you become a slave to me, a bondservant. Challenging, isn't it? Because in this parable, we're those being invited, but we're also those going out. And so he's not just saying it 2,000 years ago. He's saying it to us. I want to, se I want to send you out as a bondservant of the Most High God. Amen. Isn't that exciting? I mean, raise your hand if you want to be a bondservant of the Lord. Amen. I think we do. Amen. Let's do it. All right. Now, we're good. okay, so he sent them out. He sent them out. There's like three different times he sent them out. He sent them out first. It says those who had been invited. So this is you know, at the time of the cross. So those who had been invited at this point in time were the Jews. He sent them out to the, to the Jews who had been invited at that point uh, in time. And so, but he sends them also out after that to, into the highways and the byways to those uh, who would be good or evil to gather, to gather all. So he's sending out everybody. Uh, he's sending them out to everybody, but he sent them out to the Jews. And we, look, and we see some of the excuses uh, that they, they offered there. Some said no. You know, they said, no, I'm not interested. Some paid no attention to them. They sent them out and they just paid no attention. And they went on their way. But then some even got offended at the invitation. And even in this case, even uh, persecuted and even murdered them. Um, so, you know, I don't know if you about you, but as one who's kind of been walking in this forerunner uh, function for a number of years, I've, been, I've encountered every one of these. I, mean, I haven't been killed yet, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I have not. Yeah, this is my angel actually talking. No, I haven't been killed yet. But uh, who knows, you know. Uh, uh, not, I'm not volunteering for martyrdom, but, you know, it may come. Who knows what. Anyway, that's, not, that's for a different day. We won't talk about that. On Mother's Day, we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> I mean, to tell you, I'll tell you one little story. Uh, we usually tell this every Mother's Day. But... I, think, I don't think, I don't know if it was the first Mother's Day when we started the church. You know, we started, my wife and I started the church uh, 30 years ago or so. And this was Randall and Teresa's, Teresa's first Mother's Day. So I don't know how many years ago it was. But I don't know what I was thinking. But I, my message, my Mother's Day message for that day was controlling mothers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Who, who in their right mind would teach a message on controlling mothers on Mother's Day. <laughs> I mean, this is bad enough, you know, about the marriage stuff. With the... Yeah, and so anyway, you know, at the end of the service, all the mothers were in tears, repenting at the altar. And, uh, uh, so anyway, I've learned my lesson. I'll never do another message on Mother's Day on controlling women. Probably never another message on controlling women at all, you know. It's, it's probably not good. But anyway, uh, Okay, 
So we're talking about excuses, you know. I mean, as I've gone out, as I've gone out and shared about the bride and the bride making herself ready, I've come into all these. Some are just unwilling. They're just saying, "Nah, I don't believe it." You know, I'm not saying they don't they don't believe that they're a Christian, but in terms of the bride need and making themselves ready, I don't I don't believe it. Others just say, "Okay, yeah, yeah, that's good, yeah." Pay no attention to it whatsoever. Just go their own way. And some get offended that you've even asked them about and told them about the bride and they can meet and make herself ready. Have any of you encountered any of those reactions? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very common. It's not just... Uh, Today, I mean, let me, let me just look at another uh, Luke 14. This, this is a kind of a parallel passage. Now, this, this is not during the last week of Jesus' ministry. But here's what he, he talks, he, Jesus gives another example of a man, of a man giving a dinner, a, a di big dinner for, his, uh, for others. Uh, and at the dinner hour, he sent out his slaves. He said, some, everything is ready. Uh, and they, but they all begin to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. You know, I bought a house. I need to, t I need to get it all decorated. Uh, please consider me excused. And another one said, I bought a yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. You know, I've got a new toy. I got a boat, man. I'm gonna go right, go to the lake. It sounds good to me. I don't know, but please consider me excused. Another one said, "I married a wife, and for that reason, I cannot come." But the slave came back and reported this. And here's, I'll just go to the last verse of it. He says, "For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner." Because they had excuses. Now, of course, he's making the, he's talking about the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he's saying, all these people that, that have given you excuses, now maybe they'll come around later. But if we use all these excuses and don't, you know, don't say yes to be made ready to be invited to that, they'll not taste of his dinner. And he said, I mean, I don't know what it's going to be like, but I, I, I know enough to know that I want, I want to be a part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. He, Jesus, when Jesus said, blessed is the one who is invited to that, I want to be invited to it. I absolutely want to be invited to it. And you do too. But the point here that he's making to all of us and to those who will invite, there is no excuse. That's, the, that's his point between Matthew 22 and Luke 14. He said, there, there's no excuse for not making yourself ready. You know, he, in Luke 14, he covered just about everything. You know, he covered job. He covered uh, uh, just different things that we enjoy doing. He, he covered our owner property that we would own. He covered uh, wife and family. And I understand there are different times and seasons in life, but what he's saying is you have to, to make yourself ready for this event. You have to focus your life on making yourself ready for this event. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, let's go back to, to let's read on Matthew uh, 22. So anyway, what he did, um, the king was enraged and sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. You know, so, so God was not happy with the fact that they had rejected his invitation. And that happened, it's really a twofold purpose. It happened in AD 70 when the temple was destroyed, but it also is a picture to the, to the judgment, the end time judgment of the Lord. And so then in verse eight, he said, he, he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, 
Now, that's an important point. The wedding is ready. You know, we've, we've all looked at the end times with, okay, when the Lord gets everything in heaven ready, he's going to come back. But, of course, that's not the, the way it is. The wedding is ready. The marriage supper has been prepared. What he's waiting on is the bride to be made ready. He said, the wedding is ready. The, bride, the marriage supper is ready. But he's waiting for the bride to be made ready. All right, let's move on. But those who were invited were not worthy. So he's looking for, he's looking for a people who are worthy, who are worthy of his, uh, of his invitation. So then he sends his slaves out again. They go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite them to the wedding feast. And those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and and good. So that refers to, I believe, both the lost and the saved. I mean, you know, there are a lot, there are a lot of people who are not believers, born again believers, who are good people. But being good is not enough. You have to be born again, whether you're good or, or whether you're evil. But I think what he's referring to here is invite everybody, whether they're born again whether they're really going to be believe, or really believers or whether they're, they're not believers. Invite them to come to the wedding feast. And then he says, the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. The wedding hall was filled. That's when the Lord's going to come back, when the, when the bride is fully made ready and the wedding hall is filled with dinner guests. Not a certain fixed time, but when the bride has been made ready. So anyway, then, then we get to verse 11. And I, I believe, you know, let me, let me just say one more thing before we move on. I believe there really will be, and I believe it's even in the immediate future, there's an anointing coming that, to fill the wedding hall. Just a word of encouragement to those who have been invited and nobody seems like they're interested and all of that. I believe the Lord is saying that he's going to fill the wedding hall. He's going to fill it up. And, and so we live in an age when he'll use us to help fill that wedding hall. So be encouraged, forerunners. Be encouraged because I really believe we're in a season. Yes, darkness is increasing in the earth dramatically. But as it does, I believe God's glory is going to come. And people are going to be drawn to making themselves ready. They're going to see that there are no crutches. And there are no... Uh, solutions outside of God. And they're going to come to him and that's going to fill that wedding hall. And I, I'm excited about that. I'm not too excited about the bad stuff coming because who knows where, what all that will be. But I'm excited that God's glory will rise in the midst of that. Okay. Amen, amen, amen. All right. Okay. Okay, now we move to verse 11. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guest... He saw there a man not dressed in wedding clothes. Okay, he, the king came in to look over the dinner guests. Okay, so that's at the, at the second coming. That's what happens at the second coming. Jesus is going to come and we're going to, every believer will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and, give an, and he will examine us to, for one, if we're born again, but, I mean, or even those who are born again, he'll examine us for uh, our bridal garments. You know, and, and going back to Revelation 19, which we talked about a couple sessions ago, he said that, you know, the bride has made herself ready for it was granted or given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, which are what? Which are the righteous acts of the saints. That's the bridal garments, the fine linen, bright and clean, which are the righteous acts of the saints. And now, remember we talked about it's not, uh, you know, how many soup kitchens I can work out and that type of righteous act. It's personal transformation uh, of our inward man uh, that would lead to being obedient to the deeds that he leads us to do, following the Lamb wherever he goes, heeding the commandments to, that he gives to us. And so 
that's the, that's the, the, the wedding garments based on Revelation 19. When he said the man doesn't have wedding garments on, in other words, he's not dressed in fine linen, bright and clean. Uh, he's, he, he, because he is not, he's, he's, he may have said yes to come, but not yes to come to the point of being clothed in, these, in the righteousness of God. And so in Revelation 19, it says it was given to him. Now, what that remember, if you remember what I said there a couple of times ago, the given is really God granting him wedding garments. He can't put them on himself. Only God can put them on. But they come as a result of him saying yes to the Lord and then pursuing the righteousness of God over their lifetime and the righteous transformation into Christ's likeness. Uh, and so that's what, when we go back to Matthew 22, that's what we're dealing with. Jesus comes in at the time, at the end of the age, and he looks over every believer's life and he examines us to see if we have bridal garments on. Now he has to give them to us, but they come as a result of our making ourselves ready. There's a personal pur purpose in that, making ourselves ready uh, there. And so he looks at the one, and of course in Matthew 22, he looks at that, and he saw there a man not dressed in wedding clothes. And so he said to this man, he says, friend, how'd you get in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Now, let's deal with, let's deal with friends. I want to, I'm going word by word here to a degree, but I think it's important. He says the word friend. You know, and, and Jesus called the disciples in John friends. I don't call you slaves anymore. I call you friends. Yeah. But this Greek word here is a different Greek word than that Greek word in John 15. So in John 15, it's a word of endearment. You're, you're my friend. You know, I mean, we all want to be called a friend of God. I don't call, Ken, I don't call you a slave anymore. I call you a friend. I mean, every one of us would want that. I know we do want that. And I believe we, I believe we are for the most, you know, hopefully we are a friend of God. But this word here is not friend. It's, it's uh, and the, the Greek word is actually in the, in the notes but it's, it's just a general term of, uh, of greeting. Hey, buddy, uh, where you had you get in here? It's not quite maybe that, maybe not quite that bad. <laughs> but it's like, you know, you, you've all used something like that, friend. Hey, friend. When you're not, it's not really your friend. Okay, that's what he's saying there. He's saying, how'd you get in here? Because you're not dressed in wedding clothes. And then we get to this exciting part of the parable. Then he said to the servants, to the bond servants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Amen. Bless, it's a blessed... Uh, Blessed scripture verse in it. It's a challenging one, obviously. I'm just joking there. He says, okay, this one that doesn't dress in wedding clothes, you bind him hand and foot and you cast him into the outer darkness. So, you know, when you first read that, it, what does it sound like? It sounds to me like, okay, you either get wedding clothes on or you're going to be thrown into hell. Is that what, you, is that what it kind of sounds like? Well, I want to say, I want, I want to show you that I don't think it means that. I don't believe it means that in this context. It can in other contexts probably, but not in this uh, context. Um, I'm going to need my notes here for this one. Okay, so let's talk about outer darkness. Outer darkness appears three times in the New Testament. All three times are in the book of Matthew. Uh, Matthew 8 10 through 12, uh, this passage, Matthew 22, and Matthew 25, 
28 through 30, which is the parable of the talents. Okay, so if you read, read through these, uh, Matthew 8, I had all these scriptures all printed out n neatly, but they're all jumbled up here. So anyway, I just have to go to the Bible. But uh, Matthew 8, 10 through 12, Jesus was saying, Truly I say to you, I have not found such a great faith with anyone in Israel. And I say to you that many shall come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom shall be cast, cast into the outer darkness in that place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, that is in the setting of a dining experience, okay? With the word recline with uh, Abraham uh, is really the word dine. So there, there's, it's a kind of in the setting of a banquet. Obviously, Matthew 22 is in the setting of a banquet. Matthew 25, which is the parable of the talents, and you're familiar with Matthew 25, where a man goes on a long journey, and then when he returns, uh, he settles the accounts with the, with the servants that he had sent and given them an assignment. And so when you, when you look at that, most likely that there was a banquet uh, involved, given for the man when he comes back. And so they were casting them out of, the, uh, out of the, the event. So a lot of the commentators, some of the commentators, say that this um, outer darkness is really, because all these settings are in a, the context of a banquet, are casting them out of the banquet hall, not cast into hell necessarily. I think it, so it depends on the, the context. Now the literal meaning of outer darkness is darkness that is outside. Darkness that is outside. Uh, here, here's the, the complete Jewish Bible translation captures this meaning. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him outside in the dark. Outside in the dark. Um, Thayer's Greek lexicon says this, it refers to the darkness outside the limits of the lighted palace. Um, so one of, the, one of the things, and I think, I think this is right, outer darkness doesn't necessarily mean a specific place. It doesn't always mean hell. What it means is it means you're cast out in the context of what the scripture is talking about. So in Matthew 22, they're talking about a banquet hall. They're not talking about heaven or hell. They're talking about a banquet hall. And they're saying, and so in that context, what they're saying is you're, that person is being cast out of the banquet hall uh, into a place where it's dark. Now, you know, this was 2,000 years ago, and they didn't have electricity back then. And so it was pretty dark because uh, the banquets were held at night. So it was pretty dark uh, at night. And so they were cast out into the dark. Uh, now, in Matthew 8, it, it's a good chance that it, it may be talking about hell there. But Matthew, the parable of, ten of the talents wouldn't be talking about hell because if that's, if it, if that's talking about hell... That's saying that, okay, I'm going to give his servants, his slaves, people who know him, in other words, born-again people, I'm going to give you something to do business with until I come back. Different gifts. And, and so what that would say, if you said he's cast into hell, then, okay, if you don't do, you know, you're born, truly born again, but you don't do anything with what I've given to you, then you're cast into hell. So that would kind of come up with a, somewhat of a works theology. And so in that setting, uh, that would not be hell. Matthew 8 may be. Matthew 22 is not. It's then you're cast into the outside the banquet hall. But there's more support for that than that. I I'm really spending some time on this because I this is a really important issue. Um, another point is in the Septuagint, which is the, that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, outer is used 12 times uh, in the book of Ezekiel. In these instances, it refers to the outside court 
or the outer court of the temple. The outer court of the temple, the, out, the outer court. It's kind of like the, the lowest level uh, in the temple. Uh, so that is another thing that it doesn't necessarily mean hell. Uh, and then several prophetic voices have said that the reference to the outer court of he- is to the outer court of heaven. And I just quoted Rick Joyner in his book, Final Quest, which a lot of you have read. Uh, he said this, he wrote this, when I was still not even halfway to the throne, he had an encounter where he was caught up to heaven and he started out at the lowest level of heaven and then he was moving to higher realms of glory. And he said, when I was still not even halfway to the throne, what had been the indescribable glory of the first rank, those in the lowest level of heaven, now seemed to be in the outer darkness in comparison to the glory of of those I was now passing. They seemed to be in outer darkness to those that uh, I was uh, now seeing. So here is my, here's my belief on it, that in this context, when he says he was cast, cast into the outer darkness, he was not saying he's cast into hell. Uh, you know, because he had said yes, he had come to the, ma- the, bar- the marriage uh, supper, uh, he said yes to the invitation. So in my interpretation, he was born again, but he didn't properly put on wedding clothes. And so he was cast out of the wedding, uh, the marriage supper, into the outer darkness, not to hell, but into a lower position of heaven, which still makes you want to say, man, I want to get wedding clothes on because I don't want to be cast out or not allowed to enter uh, into the uh, into the highest realm of glory. I want to get as be there as much glory as I can get in. Now that's not a pride thing. It's just I want to be close and to Jesus as I can get for all of eternity. So they're casting him out of the banquet hall uh, into uh, into a lower level uh, of of heaven, and there will be there weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, I need to look at this uh, as well. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, that appears is a full statement. Weeping and gnashing of teeth appears seven times in the New Testament. Some of those refer to hell, but some don't. Uh, you know, because it appears in, in the parable of the talents, and that would not refer to hell. But in Matthew 13, uh, it probably does refer to hell. Now, so here, here's my interpretation of weeping and gnashing of teeth. They're cast into the outer darkness, and when they get there, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, weeping is just a, an extreme sense of mourning and remorse of what has been lost. They're weeping because they've lost uh, what they, they know now what they lost. Uh, so there we- there's a great weeping. And gnashing of teeth is just like gritting of the teeth in anger and rage, uh, just intense emotions uh, of, of misery, of disappointment, pain. And so these two things become a vivid representation uh, of what, you, what people will encounter when they didn't pay the price uh, to get clothed in, gar- in bridal garments. Um, and so it's what, what it should do, I hope it's doing this, it should shake, I mean, it should shake all of us to want to say, man, I, I need to get ready. What, you know, we're not going to be cast into hell, but there's going to be extreme anguish out of this. You know, one word I, I probably should have dealt with a minute ago is they, the man was speechless, speechless. Can you imagine? I mean, just think about, just think about the evangelical church that has no idea about the need to clothe ourselves in bridal garments. And when the king comes in to examine, it can be complete shock. I thought I was ready just because I accepted Christ. 
And, you know, I mean, it's going to be shock. Either, I think it's probably coming from one, two or three different places. One, they have no idea. And when Christ takes us to the judgment seat, we will have no idea. Some will have no idea. Others will have an idea, but they won't pay attention to it because they, they're saying, um, you know, I didn't think the consequences were going to be that important. So he's speechless when, he, when that person was cast out of the banquet hall into the a lower level of heaven. Now, then he says there many are called and few are chosen. Many are called and few are chosen. We dealt with that in a lot in the last session, so I'm not going to deal with it too, too much here, but I do want to make, just explain it. Many are called. The word called is invited. It's the same as invited. Many are invited. In fact, you see, that's what they, the whole part, first part of the parable, they're invited, all these people, uh, to this wedding feast. Uh, you know, so a multitude was invited, but few were chosen. And chosen is, means selected from a larger group, selected from a larger group. You know, it, it's the... It comes from two Greek words. Ek means from, and uh, lego means uh, selected from. Uh, and I, I used this example in the last time when I taught on it. Um, you, you know, you've all probably played with Legos, and what do they do? You get you lay them all out on the table, and then you know, step three says you find this piece. So you have to look through all these different pieces that you've laid out on the table and say, ah, there it is. And you select it and you put it into the proper place. That's the way it is. Many are called. Many are invited. Everybody, in fact, everybody is invited to the wedding feast. Uh, throughout the earth, the highways and the byways, the good and the evil, everyone is invited. Many are called. But few are chosen to be in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, who are those that are chosen? I mean, it's, it's available to everybody. It's not a, like God's sovereign choice. Okay, you're either chosen or you're not chosen. It's like few pay enough attention to the invitation to say yes to it to be made ready because it's a lifelong journey to make ourselves ready. For every one of us, you could say yes in the emotion of an altar call, and that's good. That's the first start. But if that's all it takes, you'll not be ready. It's, it's the readiness of preparation to put on the bridal garments, which is the righteousness of the saints, the transformation of our inward man that comes out of that. So, Many are called and few are chosen. Now, let me, I want to give, and I'll go through these quick. I don't want you to be scared when I say this. Uh, there have 10 truths. <laughs> 10, oh no, it's almost noon here. Happy Mother's Day, I know, 10, 10 <laughs> I won't spend more than 10 minutes on each truth. No, I, I won't spend much time on them. Let me find them here. Here we go. But I do want to go through this. One, we, we talked about the parable confirms that there really will be a wedding between Christ and his bride, prepared bride, accompanied by the marriage supper of the Lamb. And these are all in your notes. You don't have to write them down, but which will be online. So... That, I hit that earlier a lot, but there, there really will be a marriage supper. There really will be a wedding. People really will not be allowed to enter into it because they've not made themselves ready. Uh, number two, from heaven's perspective, the wedding is ready, but the people are not. It's not a fixed date, but it's when the bride has made, in full numbers, has made herself ready and the wedding hall is filled. 
Number three, not every believer will be a part of the bridal company or invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We need to really get that in our, in our mind. Not every born-again believer is a betrothed bride to Christ and called a bride, but not every believer will be the eternal wife of the Lamb. Those who make themselves ready will be that. Number four, the invitation given is not for salvation in this parable. The invitation given is not for salvation, but to become the wife of Christ and to be allowed entry into the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is not, as a lot of commentators would say, is an invitation to salvation. It is not. Now, salvation is the first step to that. Nobody will get into the marriage supper of the Lamb without first being born again, truly born again. But it's more than that. It's about being born again and then making yourself ready as a wife, a worthy wife for Christ, uh, which means he wants our life after that. Number five, everyone who wants to be a part of the bridal company and to be allowed entry into the marriage supper must say yes to the invitation. Must say yes to the invitation. And again, the invitation is not to salvation, it's to be made ready. You must say yes to it. Remember we talked about Luke 14 and all the different excuses and all that. There's, there's no excuse for any of us. And this is challenging, to, just as challenging to me as it is to you. Uh, there's no excuse for these things. We have to say yes to the invitation. Remember a lot of people say they, they've said no, they paid no attention, they got mad about it. We have to say yes to it. Um, and then number six, saying yes to the invitation is a lifetime commitment to making oneself ready as a bride for Christ. Okay, do you, do you hear that? Saying yes is a lifetime commitment to making oneself ready as a bride. Now, you know, in a, in a sense, we cannot put on bridal garments. They're given to us. But we have to make ourselves ready by pursuing it, asking God. And the, the, the idea of making ourselves ready as a bride needs to be before us regularly. I, I make that a, a, a matter of prayer because, you know, you look at yourself. I don't know if you do, but I look at myself and I see my weaknesses and my flesh patterns and all that. And I say, oh, my goodness, I've got so far to go to be made ready. Lord, help me. Be, make, make me ready. You know, that becomes a regular part of my prayer time. And I, I encourage it to become part of yours if it's not already. Lord, help me. Help me to be made ready as a wife for you, Lord. Because only he can do it, but he'll bring it to your mind and there you have to act on it. Uh, you know, it's not like he, only he can do it, so therefore I can kick back and do nothing and it'll be ready. I have to act on what he brings to my mind there. Okay, number seven, uh, forerunners. The, the next three are about forerunners. Forerunners are bond servants of Christ, totally committed to follow him in his directions. Now, this is a word to forerunners. If you're going to be, because this is a forerunner school, if you're going to be a forerunner, you must be a bond servant to Christ, totally committed to do his bidding, regardless of the cost, regardless of the response. Regardless of the warfare and the opposition and all that, you have, you, you have to be totally committed as a bondservant of the Lord with, where your number one and only priority really is to serve Jesus to make a bride ready for him. That he deserves the reward of his suffering for a bride made ready. That's what a forerunner is. You, gotta, you have to be that type of a bond servant to be that. Number eight, forerunners must carry the same burden for the church that Jesus expressed when he entered Jerusalem in his first triumphal entry. Now, we didn't read this scripture, but if you look at Luke 19, 41 or so, when Jesus came into the city, he wept over it because they had missed their day of visitation. 
The Jews had missed their day of visitation. He knew it. Now, we don't want to miss our day of visitation. And forerunners must carry that burden. Lord, help your church to wake up. Wake up to this, these issues. Verse 9, child, point 9. Forerunners must be bold to invite people to be made ready as Christ's bride. There must be a boldness there uh, where we don't shrink back regardless of what people might think or say or react to. And then number 10, it's the last one. Forerunners must be pre prepared for opposition, rejection, and persecution as they invite people to be prepared as a bride for Christ. We've got to be prepared for that. I mean, right now, my experience, as I shared a little bit earlier, has only been people declining it or just saying they're not interested or they don't believe it or things like that. Not, not really any kind of real persecution associated with it. But the way things are going in the world, I think that could change pretty quickly in terms of the level of opposition that we receive to speaking these things of Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life and the issues related to that. So anyway, that's Matthew 22. My challenge to all of us is say yes. And if you haven't said yes, say it today. To say, Lord, I, I, I say yes without excuse to my, for my desire to be made ready. And then devote your life to allowing the Holy Spirit to work in and through you to be made ready. Uh, that's my challenge to the body. My challenge to forerunners is let's be bold. Let's be committed. Uh, let's do what God wants us to do. Because the time is short. And, you know, before we know it, we'll be standing before Christ and he'll be uh, examining us and let's, let's make ourselves ready. It's the most important thing we can do. Amen. Amen. Let me just pray. Um, stand up just for a minute. I want to just pray. That... Father, um, it is my prayer for all of us, including myself, that you would empower us to be made ready. We say yes to you. Say yes if you want to do that. We, we say yes. Say it out loud if you want to. Lord, I say yes. I say yes again. I want to be made ready. And I ask for a work, and I, I pray you will ask this. I ask for a work of the Holy Spirit to empower me to put on bridal garments, fine linen, bright and clean, which are the righteous acts of the saints. I ask for that. I pray for that in the name of Jesus. And Father, for the forerunners, I pray that we would be bold, that we would be bondservants of the living God, that we would not shrink back in any way, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Help us, Lord. Amen. 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 Quentin, before you, you can be seated for me. I, Quentin, before you turn off the streaming, I, I want to share where I want to make uh, I, I want to, we might pray for people here, but I want to make it available online as well. The Lord uh, gave me a word of, of encouragement to a lot of people, I think, will be, um, it's related to Jesus' encounter with the leper. Uh, you know, the leper came, Jesus was uh, walking with his disciples, and the leper came uh, to him and bowed down and asked uh, to be cleansed. And Jesus said, I, I will do it. And he cleansed him, and he was cleansed. But the context of that is the leper, before he was cleansed, was totally isolated from everybody. Nobody wanted to be around him because it was a highly contagious disease, and nobody wanted to get it. 
And so he was very isolated. No, every time he would encounter people, they would, they would see that he was a leper and they would r run from him. And, and I, I, what I, here's the word. What I believe is that there are people who for whatever reason have almost been like lepers. That, uh, you know, maybe it's because of the past, your past. Maybe it's because of other situations, totally different situations. But you feel isolated, totally separate from people where you try to, uh, you know, be accepted by them. It could be family issues. It could be any number of things. But I want the, here's the word. I believe the Lord is saying that, that we're entering a season where the lepers are going to be healed, where the lepers will be healed. Those who have encountered that type of thing will be healed. And so if that pertains to you, believe God that he will bring a healing anointing there. And I think what I'll do is if you cut it off and if, if it's okay, I would just, I won't spend a lot of time praying because I know probably a lot of you have different uh, family things to do. But if that's you, let's all stand up. And if that's you, just come to the front and we'll just have a general prayer. There's something about coming to the front. Maybe it's not for anybody here, it's for online. But I do really believe it's a, it's a real issue. Well, you've had trouble interacting with people for whatever reason. It could be um, just a family situation. It could be something in your past. It could be any number of things. So if that's you, just come to the front. I know it may, it may not be the easiest thing to come forward to, but... Yeah, I think we, we, we turned it off. Yeah, it's already off. Yeah, it's all right. Uh, so anybody, is it, 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 anybody there? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, Lord. Well, Lord, I just lift up Patricia to you. And Lord, whatever the situation is, we pray for a transition a transition into a new season where she's been isolated and separated. We ask, Father, that even on this day, there would be a transition to a new time and a new season. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 All right, amen. That's... Uh, uh, remember, uh, you got more. Okay, yeah, that's what. I got a couple things. Oh, okay.